Good morning. That's loud. Praise the Lord. I hope everybody's doing well this morning. Let's get the show on the road. <laughs> you know, th this morning as I was uh, thinking about what I'm going to talk about, I started thinking, what kind of jokes can I make? <laughs> Start, uh, you know, I remember in some of pastor's sermons, he references uh, movies sometimes. And it seems like every time that I talk, I reference a TV show. <laughs> so this is, yeah, this is kind of like the Hollywood church. <laughs> so that's the joke that I thought of. Uh, but I want to start by reading from Hebrews 11, just verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Friday night, uh, I was watching a TV show, and it's called Parenthood. And in, in the show, there's this couple that uh, they're going through a divorce right now. And at the end of the episode, it was very, I don't know, emotionally intense in the sense of all the drama of what happened and whatnot. I'll tell you about it in a little bit. But after I saw that, I didn't think any of it. But then yesterday, uh, I had to go to work, and as I was walking to get some food, I started thinking about that for some reason. So what happened uh, in the episode is that the guy, he goes to his father-in-law's house to say goodbye. And he says, oh, so you're giving up? Do you love your children? Do you love your wife? And you gotta fight for them. And you fight until the very last moment. And you don't give up until you get her back. So then at the end of the episode, he goes to the house where she's living and he starts saying, you know, last year you told me to fight for us and I was a fool, I didn't listen. But you know what, I don't wanna spend any second without you anymore. So I'm sitting in there, I'm like, drama, you know? Uh, but then yesterday I started thinking about that as I'm walking and, I, and I'm exchanging text messages with my mother and for some reason, I felt like I had to share that with her. And after I told her that, I said, you know what? And, and I feel the spirit moving right now. And I started wondering, how do I fight for what's mine? But not in the sense of how do I do it, but what is it that I'm doing right now to fight for what's mine? And the Spirit revealed to me that th this is this is what I what I uh, send my mom. The way that you the, this is what the Spirit revealed to me: the way that you fight is by believing in God, by believing in His Word, by declaring what His Word says, and when you leave each day with the certainty and security that what you lost, he will, be, he will give it back to you and then some. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then I started thinking, we as Christians, and, and I don't know if, if all of you have experienced this, but what I have seen is that people around us that either believe in religion or don't believe anything at all, label us as crazy because there's nothing that we have to do for God to do something for us. 
And because of that, we get the sense of reassurance. And we're just, you know, hey, what's going on? Oh, nothing. My roof has fallen off. And you're not worried? Nope. God will provide. Man, you're crazy. No, I'm not. I just know that what his word says, it's going to happen. Because he said, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. I'm going to be there with you all the time. I'm going to provide for you. Uh, <coughs> man, I lost my train of thought there for a second. But as I was thinking about that, sometimes our flesh tries to take over. No, you got to do this. You got to do that. No, you don't. It's, it's as simple as just saying, okay, Lord, you said it. I believe that's it. Just keep going. Mm-hmm. And uh, I know the pastor has talked about this several times and, and and very recently, actually, and and it's really hard for us as humans to wrap our head around the fact that there's nothing that we have to do mm-hmm. for the things that happen in our lives that come from God to happen. And as I'm thinking of this, I started <coughs> going back into my entire journey since I said yes to the Lord and. and Man, I was a very, I want to say bitter, but very cynical person. And uh, right now I feel so different that then I started wondering, am I working too hard to be the person that I am right now? Yeah. But then I'm like, no, because I'm not trying to do anything that I feel that I should do. I'm not putting any effort whatsoever. As soon as I said yes, the floodgates opened and the shower of blessings started coming and my life became, I don't know, better, new. So everything that it says in the Bible, you know, when you're born again, you're a new creature. That's true. Uh, I know we talk about how when we are born again, our DNA changes, and I start picturing the opening credits for the Spider-Man movie when the DNA of the spider starts mixing with the DNA of Peter Parker. That's right, I'm a comic fan. Uh, and, th- and that's exactly what happened, you know. Uh, when we are washed by the blood of Jesus, when that blood and us, we mix, the rearranging of the DNA starts happening. Mm-hmm. So that's how you know that you are a, a changed person, yes. a new person. Mm-hmm. So if you think that you're not doing what you're supposed to do, don't worry, Fred. You're fine. Yes. Because there's nothing that we have to do. Yeah. All we have to do is say, yes, Lord. Yes. I believe you. Yes. Yes. And that's it. a little nugget of wisdom for today. It sounded much better in my head. Uh, <laughs> anyone has any uh, prayer requests or testimony? Yes, Debbie.
mobile and lucid yes, and yes. know what's going on Absolutely. and be themselves. Yes. I, I think we ought to just claim that yes. because yes. God said, if we can't claim that, we'll never be able to claim, right. claim the dead to come back to life. Think of it. Yeah. How in the world are you going to stand over a corpse and say, you know, and I don't even yeah. know. I, I believe the Lord will tell us yeah. who and when and like Jesus said, you know, he said, I know you hear me always, but for these people, when he was talking to Lazarus, he said, that, that's why this all. We are not islands. I'm telling you what, God has a plan for every one of us that fits into this master plan yes. he has yes. of redeeming the lost. Yes. Yes. They're out there. They are. And, and I, I, it, I don't have it all, but I keep having these dreams, and, and some of them are very troubling. Because the, the enemy, come, you know, he tries to throw his two cents worth in there. And I know if it's happening to me, it's happening to you guys too. Yeah. We're in a battle. Yeah. Right. We're in a battle. But if we can't, we have to get, I told Nathan that last week, and I believe this. This is the period where the Lord said you'd be sifted as gold. Mm -hmm. Every time we have these situations, doubts work their way to the surface. And they're skimmed off. And we become more and more focused in, just like I said, and I got to get a hold of this. We all do. Nothing is impossible with God. Yeah. He said nothing. Nothing. Right. Not a few things are. Nothing. Right. Meaning anything my mind could conceive, right. he could exactly. do. You just can't. 
enjoy it in this life. But how many of us commit yeah. gradual suicide? Yeah. 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 I mean, we just don't put a gun to our head right, or, or whatever. We're just doing it. We just do it over a period of 25, 30 years. Yeah, exactly. That's true. So it's, it's just like any other failure in humanity. Yeah. 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 I don't care if it's you know, hating somebody. Yeah. Coveting somebody else's yeah. something or yeah. having a, a you know a, a marital affair. All these things are painful. All of those things are hurtful. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they hurt other people. Mm -hmm. Suicide, the person who commits the suicide, they're with the Lord if they're a believer. Who's left? They hurt. They they're in pain. They're mm -hmm. suffering because they can't make heads or tails out of it. They can't make sense out of it. Mm -hmm. That's right. But that person's not going to be punished for it. That, exactly. that makes God just what person's lost their opportunity to represent God in yes. that world. Yeah. But we all know people that have made horrible choices throughout their life. Sure. Maybe they got drunk and went out yeah. and slammed their car into somebody and yeah. got killed. Do we think that just because they had a momentary weakness yeah. and, and because of emotions or whatever and they, they made a mistake yeah. and now they're dead that God's not going to receive them, yeah. that God's yeah. not going to forgive them? make choices, and all of our choices we yep. we make have consequences. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. But that's one that, as far as this life is concerned, can't be undone. Right. So God doesn't get to turn it around for good, right. except for that individual who was going to lose the Lord. That's, that's the way I feel about it. I know how the, the original church, the universal church, the Catholic church, I know how they feel about it. I know their, their belief system, but that's partly because they believe right of last rites. If somebody isn't there to pronounce them unguilt, not guilty, mm -hmm. then anybody can go to hell, at least to purgatory. Yeah. I mean, how, you know, I understand the, the ritual aspect of it and the theology of it, but it just doesn't make sense spiritually speaking. Yeah. It doesn't. When we don't even have to, I, I talked about it Wednesday night. says, confess your sin. Right? In John. He's not saying that we're supposed to go to God every time we sin and, and, and confess our sins. He's, he, confession <coughs> is agreement. Right. We agree with God about sin. Sin's not good. I agree it's not good. But I'm agreeing that it's already been dealt with. Yes. That's what he means by confessing. When we confess, we do the same thing when we confess these scriptures up here. Yeah. We're just saying, I agree with what God yes. says. I'm confessing what the word of God says about it. So when we confess, when he talks about confess your sins and God is just and, and, and will forgive you, he's saying when we agree with God about what Jesus did uh -huh. concerning our sin, we're set free from it. We are free indeed. Mm -hmm. The evil of that cannot touch us. That's right. If you can search the New Testament, there's nothing in there about you asking God for forgiveness. I'm talking about believers now. There's nothing in there. One place it's used, and it's not used in, in the sense that we, the church normally teaches it. Because if you just use common knowledge, you would say, look, if sin is what Jesus said it is, it's not, it's not what you're doing, it's what every thought that you have, then there aren't enough hours in the day. Because every time I turn my head, I'm, I'm not yeah. totally agreeing with what the Word of God says. Somebody's irritating me. Somebody's aggravating yeah. me. Some situation is just burning me up. And I'm mad. And I'm angry. And I'm frustrated. And I'm, you know, yeah. I want more. I, mm -hmm. I don't want gravy on my mashed potatoes. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, that's what we, that's the way we are. So, look, there, and, and then there's, Them being sin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just, it just is. So 
still not looking and went to the doctor to see if I got a tumor called shrinking. And the doctor said, you know, you know, you know, you know, him. Mm-hmm. Nothing else can be done for him but the shrinking and they're telling him he has only two ideas. finish in Jesus' name, Lord, and we know that everything we say and declare according to your word is going to come to pass in our lives and in the lives of others. Right now, Lord, we claim the healing for those that are sick. We claim that those chains are broken for those that are being held captive by this world, Lord. Those that are being oppressed right now are being freed from that oppression, Father. We thank you, Lord, for all the promises that you have made. For your goodness, Father, for your kindness, for your mercy. Because we know you are a good God. You are not a God that, that kills people. You are not a God that condemns people. You only want us to become more to you and rest in the finished work of the cross. children's children's ministry sorry there's a sign-up sheet in the back and uh, if you want to elaborate Suzanne Martha or Danny we're signing up in blocks of two weeks (laughs) (laughs) all right and then this coming Friday Eastern Gate has a prayer we're gonna go where the Lord leads it's gonna be good so if you can make it I guarantee you Top notch. And the Gideons are going to be here next Sunday. Uh, we're going to have a special offering for them. Correct? Okay. Yeah. Now that you give us great credit, so it's a lot of it's a lot of good uh, presentations that they make. <coughs> it is a team that gives about a 15 10 15 minute presentation to set up on and for them. And they have such a beautiful facility to work with for the Gideons. Let's confess the word. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons. I speak in new tongues. I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but I am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, 
and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now installed. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of the servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Uh, Jason and Toby, would you mind taking the offering, please? Jason, could you say the blessing, please? Worship. As we were speaking about authority of the Lord and things that the Lord is desiring to do. <coughs> you normally don't go into a battlefield without a weapon. And I know that we're not supposed to battle with our brothers and sisters in Christ. All we can do is offer them the truth. This pastor is revealing anywhere from 10 to 25 scriptures at every given meeting. We need to understand that these are quivers mm -hmm. to put in, to be ready at any time. Because mm -hmm. one, those that are caught up in religion don't understand the message of grace, truth, and freedom. We need to pull the scriptures out and say, well, the Lord says this. Yeah, yeah. The Lord says that. Yeah. Not to kill them, but to penetrate their heart with the truth. Mm -hmm. Okay? There's a veil, yes. There's a veil. And so many religions and so many times I've seen where that law situation is actually taking the rented veil and trying to sew it back up. Uh, it ain't gonna happen, not on my watch. So take these scriptures the pastor's giving us, as the Lord is giving us, let's get our quivers full. Not only have them ready, but have them in our minds and our hearts. Because you never know what they're gonna challenge you with. Just like when Satan was tempting Jesus out in the wilderness, he always answers scripture with scripture. Okay? We need to ingrain these in our hearts. Okay? Back in 1993, when I was going through one of the darkest times of my life, the Lord gave me a promise concerning my children. In Isaiah 49, I'll just shorten this up real quick. In Isaiah 49, 22, it says, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up my hands, to the Gentiles and set up my standard in the people and they shall bring their sons in their arms and carry their daughters upon their shoulders. Yes. This is after I lost my children. Okay? I have two of them back. They love the Lord and they're ministering to the younger two at this point in time. The end of the story is in verse 25 it says, but thus saith the Lord even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away and prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For I will contend with him who contendeth with thee, and I will save thy children. Yes. Not one of them, not two of them, but all of them. Yes. Okay? Yes. So if you have anyone who's caught in a situation that is not of the Lord, claim his word. Shoot it. Right now, we're in the, I got my foothold. I know I'm in the enemy's camp. I got a foot in there because I can feel the resistance. <coughs> But that's okay, because he has overcome yes. by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimonies. Yes. These yes. testimonies are coming now, and I'm proclaiming them to freedom right now yes. in the name of Jesus. Yes. In the name of Jesus. So let's just worship the Lord and love on him.
overcome by worshiping you, Lord. For you alone are worthy.
Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. I was just thinking that we are all in lesser and greater degrees. Jacob's still wrestling with God, trying to get the upper hand, trying to be in charge, trying to take control. And that's what the scripture means when it says to deny yourself. Not to deny yourself clothing or shelter or food or the, the things of life that God has certainly blessed us with, but to deny ourselves, our abilities, everything that Roberto was talking about up here this morning and into some degree in, in what all of you have said this morning. This is about God. And yet, we still wrestle. And the more religious we are, it seems like the longer we want to stay in the struggle and wrestle with it. But God has touched us in our thigh. Amen? He has given us Jesus. He has showed us our weakness. But in his strength, our weakness is made perfect. Amen? We need to open our eyes to the angels ascending and descending and what God is making available to each and every one of us it has nothing to do with religion per se. It has to do with a relationship with God, that God wants to be our provider. He wants to be our, our best friend, our husband, yes. amen, our father, and many, many other things. The minute we stop wrestling, the minute we deny ourselves and say, I don't have anything to add to this equation. I have nothing to give that God really wants or needs. The only thing God wants from me is to acknowledge him, what he has done. That's all he asks. That's all it asks anywhere in the Bible. When I was talking about before about our forgiveness, I'm talking about in the epistles, in the letters that are written to the church. God's not asking for us to beg him for forgiveness. He's already forgiven us. Whenever religious people or religion itself puts something up there for us to do or something that we have done to separate us from God, it's not true. It's not biblically correct. It's just not. God, in the person of Jesus Christ, took care of the sin problem. Sin is not an issue with God anymore. You say, well, is everybody going to heaven? No. Some people are still going to be judged by the law because they wouldn't accept Jesus. But that's the, only, that's the only variable here. It's the only thing that we do. We believe. And that's exactly what Paul was talking about in Galatians when he said, having begun in the Spirit, we started this thing out by simply believing in what Jesus has done. Now everything else we do in our relationship with God works the same way. It isn't now what I'm going to do. It's what he has already done. And this fight of faith is, to, is, is us constantly looking to him instead of looking to us. Right. Every time we look to ourselves, we find failure. Yeah. We find weakness. We find yeah. instability and uh, yeah. inconsistency. But our Father, <laughs> there's no variableness, no shadow of turning. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He, he changes not. He's a good God. He'll always be a good God. Hallelujah. And that's what we come here to celebrate. Yes. What he has done. Not what we're going to do, but what he has already accomplished. Amen. All we do is walk out this reality. 
just what Don was talking about, what, what uh, Jason was talking about, what, you know, what everybody that has spoken here today has been talking about. The only problem, as Jesus put it, is unbelief. Praise the Lord. If you believe, nothing shall be impossible to you. If you believe, all things are possible. When you pray, if you believe, you will have whatever it is you're praying for. Amen. I, you can be seated. I sat here a while back, and I'll just repeat myself. Faith is not the problem. Jesus told his disciples that. Faith is not the issue. It's believing. And most of us have got the two kind of mixed up. But I've, I've said it, I think I may have said it last week, I don't know. But all of us believe certain truths without any tangible evidence of it. In other words, you know, we, we believe in people that have lived a thousand years ago. We never saw them. We've never talked to them. We've never talked to anybody that saw them or talked to them. We've read a book. And we have evidence that they are people who historically lived in this world. It doesn't take faith for that. Right? You just believe it. You got information. And it's the same way with God. I know in whom I have believed. Right? Uh, Job even said, I, I believe I, in this flesh I will see my Redeemer. Though the skin worms, he said, though the, you know, the bacteria, whatever it is that happens when a body dies, devour this flesh, yet will I see him. Praise the Lord. That's what we're saying. This isn't about what we see. It's about what we believe. And it doesn't take great faith. It takes faith like a mustard seed. Just, just a tiny little about. The problem is our unbelief that Jesus told his disciples. We just have to believe what he has said is true. And that's what confession is all about. That's what, that's what all of this is about. The problem is we have gotten to the place so much so, and I'm not speaking to you specifically, but but quote unquote, church in general, the religion in general, we've gotten to uh, where we have believed not in Christ, but in what somebody said about Christ, yeah. what somebody else said. Right. Instead of us believing based on our relationship, we're believing based on somebody else's teaching or their uh, theology, not even so much about their relationship, because many of them don't have a relationship. They just got a bunch of information. You know, it's like the two guys go apply for the same job. And uh, they, the, the, the interviewer says, I'm thinking of Mike right now because you can relate to this in human service stuff. But uh, he says, look, I got, I, you, you've, you filled out all the, your background and I've got all the, your job history and so on and so forth. But I got just a little quiz. I'm going to give each of you a 10-question quiz. And it's just kind of going to give me an idea where you're coming from, you know, what your belief is, what you, kind of what your values are, and that sort of thing. So the, they both fill out the little questionnaire, the 10-question the, the question, uh, quiz. And the first guy, the human resource man, comes out. And he says, uh, okay, if you, if you finished, I'd like to talk to you first. The man comes in. He goes down the list, checks them all off. And the last one, he said, uh, I don't know the answer to that, to number 10. I, don't, I just don't have the answer to it. And the uh, human resource person says, uh, that's fine. You're, you're honest. You're just being honest, and that's, that's great. So he goes on. The next guy comes in. He goes down the list, checks all of his off, and he goes, hmm. Well, he said, it's amazing. He said, I, I just gave the job to the person in front of me. 
He said, you got identical scores on the test. You were both qualified. You both have, a, have similar education and past experience and so forth. And so the guy said, well, let me ask you something then. He said, if we got the same score, if our qualifications are basically the same, and we got the same score on the test, why didn't you hire me? And he said, well, it was that last question, number 10, where the first interviewer, interviewee, said he didn't know the answer. And you had, neither do I. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> That's what I mean by, you know what I'm saying, a lot of people just, they don't have the relationship, they just are believing what somebody else says, <laughs> what somebody else's experience okay. is, what religion has taught them instead of what they know to be reality to them. Yeah. And that's what, that's what this is all about. This is about a relationship. It's what it's always been about. That's what Jesus came here, God in the flesh, was so that we could see, have a real and a complete revelation of God. That God wants to deal with us in a relationship. Mm -hmm. He wants to interact with us. Let me, let me, let's look at the, something here this morning. And I'm going to, I probably won't get through all of this, but that's okay. We'll, we'll just do what we do. Amen. But, in the, but first of all, let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 9. And I want to read the, uh, First of all, verses 1 through 6. Most of you know this, this story. It's after, uh, you know, David and Jonathan had made a covenant. Of, they were friends. Even though Jonathan's father, Saul, was trying to kill David, uh, they made a pact that they would always be, you know, covenants are you look out for one another, you, you, do, you, you are faithful to each other, and so forth. Well, we know that eventually Saul and Jonathan were killed in a battle. <clears throat> and then David, as a result of their death, of Saul's death, David is then declared king. He had been anointed by God years before, but then he actually comes into uh, the reality of that, the, the, the tangible aspect of it, because Saul had been king and now he is no more. So after they died, David remembers that this covenant that he has with, with Jonathan. And so he says, is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called on him unto David, the king said unto him, art thou Ziba? And he said, this, thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Then the king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. Praise the Lord. Now, let's jump ahead to verse 11 <clears throat> through 13. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a son whose name was Mika. And all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants under Mephibosheth. Now, let me just show you a couple of things here before we actually get into the, this, this message for this morning. That word Mephibosheth, you many know God gave names to people that specifically identified their character. In other words, when people named them their children, it was almost 
as though God was putting those names because whatever that name was is generally what you see that person is. Like Jacob, you know, he was a liar. Uh, it means deceiver, supplanter. Uh, you, you see it over and over and over throughout, throughout the Bible. So here this, this son of Jonathan's name is Mephibosheth. And if you look this up in the, in the Strong's Concordance is where I got this, Metha is number 6284. That would be in the Hebrew part of the Bible. And it means, Metha means in English, translation means to blow out. That's the root word. And Bosheth means shame. And that is 1382, if you want to look it up. So what the word Mephibosheth means is to blow out or to speak shame. Now, Lodabar, Lo is no, N-O. And Debar is number 1696. It's the root word for word or sometimes pasture. So Lodabar, where he was, is a place of no word. So you have this man who's speaking shame, living in a place where there's no word, where there is no word of God or word from God. That's why he's speaking shame. Now, in this story, we know that everything in this Bible is about Jesus and God. There are true stories that are happening to people, but God picks these out and puts them in the Word of God to reveal himself, to reveal Jesus. That's what it's about. It's not about a history lesson. It's about God revealing himself and the way he interacts with people. So here David is a type of God the Father, and Jonathan is a type of Jesus. God made covenant with himself, right? He said, I can't find anybody that I could depend on to keep the covenant, so I will make covenant with me, myself. So God, the Spirit, makes covenant with the manifestation of that Spirit in flesh, which is Jesus. Same God, he makes covenant with himself. So in this story, David is God, the Father, if you will. Jonathan then represents the Christ. Who dies, right? He makes this covenant with himself. And we are Mephibosheth, the beneficiaries of the covenant. And the story is showing us the grace or restoration for Jesus' sake that comes to us. Mephibosheth did nothing. He was just this lame kid, scared, full of shame, Right? Afraid of God. Afraid of David. He was scared to death to come before. Because he, he's thinking David's going to get me because of everything that his grandfather had done. But the scripture says, for your shame, you shall have double honor. My shame, his glory. That is the essence of the Bible. I didn't do anything but get born into this world. Spiritually crippled, unable to connect, afraid of God. And then God just shows up and invites me to his house and says, you'll feed at my table from now until eternity. And I'll give my angels as servants to you. That's the truth of God. That's the reality of who God is and what God does. Now let's go to John chapter 10 and verse 10. I've got several scriptures here that I want to touch on just to kind of give us a context. But In John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's the devil's job. That's what the devil does. Anytime you've got loss, lack, anytime you've got death and sickness, anytime you've got destruction or, or ruin, it's, you can write it down. It's coming from the devil. It's not coming from God. It's not coming from some religious experience or lack thereof. It's coming from the enemy. That's what he does. That's his nature. 
But I have come, Jesus said, that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Overflowing. Amen. The good life. Praise the Lord. All right. Look at Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Now, religion and a lot of churches have got their act mix, mixed up here. They're, they're doing what the devil does instead of what God does. They're always pointing their finger and accusing, which is not the role of us as the body of Christ. That's the, Satan does it. He doesn't need any help. And yet we, they, they see themselves as being in this pious spiritual position when in fact they're actually operatives of the enemy. I'm not saying they're demon possessed or they're not saved. I'm just saying the devil is manipulating them and using them to, to distort God's reality, who and what God is, the same thing he did with Judaism in the early church, in the early days of, of, of God's uh, word coming to them. Jesus came and, and, and said, look, you're not a, your father's not God or Abraham, your father's the devil. Now he's talking to the people who represent Judaism. Now I'm not picking on Judaism, I, we, we need to pray for Israel, we, we, we believe that God has not forsaken them, they're not... He hasn't cast them off. He still has a love for them. They have just been temporarily blinded for our benefit. Yeah. Praise the Lord. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Now let's look at Psalms chapter 44, verses 15 and 16. My confusion is continually before me, and the shame of my face hath covered me. For the voice of him that reproacheth and blasphemeth by reason of the enemy and avenger. The confusion is continually before me, and the shame of my face hath covered me. Why? Why the shame? Because of the voice of him that reproacheth and blasphemeth by reason of the enemy. The Avenger, praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Look at John chapter 8 and verse 32. And then we'll move on a little bit here. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Yes. Praise the Lord. Who are you? That's, that's the question. It, it goes back to this Mephibosheth thing. Who are you, and what's the truth? Now, the enemy had him convinced he's something to be ashamed of. He's shameful. Amen? And the truth is, if the king ever finds you, you're dead. Most believers don't know the truth of who they are in Christ. That's why they represent God in this skewed way. So they're locked into a shame-based identity. And they want everybody else to be ashamed too. Matter of fact, they'd rather everybody else was more ashamed than them because that way they feel a little bit better. You and I were specifically chosen by God. Praise the Lord. Not because of anything we'd done, not because of anything other than God chose us. Because he made a covenant with himself. God reveals himself in all kinds of ways. Most of us, and I heard testimonies here, God revealed himself to some here just recently in healing. Many times we, we can say God's reve revealed himself to me by a financial breakthrough or provision of some kind. So God reveals himself in all kinds of ways. Sometimes it's just you just feeling the warmth of the presence of God, the love of God. You just are overwhelmed by his goodness and his kindness. So I'm not going to try to get into all of it, but I just want to talk to you about three specific ways 
that God manifests, that God wants to manifest himself in each one of our lives. More than just some intangible or, or kind of distant provider. More than just, you know, here's a paycheck, here's a job, here's a, you know, a, a loan, here, here's a, a breakthrough that you didn't think you were going to have. More than, more than that. We appreciate that, but, but he wants something personal. He wants a relationship. All of that's good and all of that's true. Our healer, all of that is absolutely who and what God is and what he wants to provide for us. But there are three things that I just want to briefly talk about this morning. And the first is he wants to be your friend. Not just a friend, but the best friend. I don't know about everybody here. I don't have a lot of friends. Uh, you know what I mean. You don't understand what I'm saying. You know, I mean, I consider you all to be my friends, but... But, you know, uh, I'm maybe not like everybody else, or maybe I'm more like everybody else than I realize. I'm not a real open person. I'm as open as I feel comfortable with being open. I mean, I'll say a lot of stupid stuff, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's what's really necessarily always going on inside. It takes a long, long time to really have a friend. Now, I, I was saying... That's why we say blood is thicker than water. It's because there are friendships within family that are just unique to that. Why? Because you can be who you are because they already know who you are. So there's no masks. There's no, you know. I had a brother-in-law that just passed away Monday. I've known him for 50 years. Good friend, my sister's husband. Great guy. Um, I'd been over there just a couple of weeks ago uh, to visit and chat a couple weeks prior to that. And we, I, he loved to talk politics. Man, we could get wound up. We had a similar kind of beliefs you know, and, and so forth. So we could really get ramped up there. And, and we did. But it was always fun because, you know, it's always fun tearing everybody else apart. But, <laughs> no, no, no. He doesn't have sense enough to believe what you believe. Everybody has a right to believe whatever they want to. Everybody has a right to be stupid. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But anyhow, uh, he was a friend. he was the kind of guy I could say anything. He knew me. He knew me before I went in the Marine Corps. I, I stayed in their house when they we went to Chicago one time for some business stuff that he was involved. He was uh, worked for IBM for thirty years, and I baby I, I house set for him. That was a huge mistake yeah. on their part because <laughs> it was like ooh, man, animal house. For, for a week and a half. And uh, if they were, they'd still be making uh, repairs on that place if, if they owned it. Actually, it was a duplex. Of, but I was leaving to go in the Marine Corps in a couple of weeks and just wasn't thinking real clear. And <laughs> just did some stupid stuff. And I brought that up. We were sitting at his kitchen table having coffee. He just laughed and he said, you know, I hadn't thought about that nearly 50 years and I knew it was the truth there are some people who would never forget or let me forget he was just that kind of guy always straight shooting honest down to earth Norwegian and I never had to pretend to be anybody but who I was. Wouldn't have done any good because he'd known me <laughs> since I was 16, 17 years old before when he and my sister were just dating. But he never held anything against me. He was always the first one there. If you needed anything, if you were in a bind, always had a joke. Usually those Oli and Olaf things, you know. You <laughs> love that. But just a good guy. That was a friend. It took 50 years. So it isn't, and it was, it was actually, it was more on his part than it was on my part. I mean, he was the one that would just accept and reach out and be your pal, you know, talk about whatever and do, you know. We, 
we became friends because he wanted to be a friend. Now, I've known a lot of people. I, I, there are people that I see every once in a while that I've known for at least that long, but they're not my friends. It isn't that I don't like them. We just, it's awkward. <laughs> you know? Anybody ever go to a class reunion? Oh, you want an awkward experience. <laughs> Unless it's people you're interacting with on a regular basis, because yeah. most of them, I don't see them anymore. I mean, we went to one, what was that one? 20th or 25th or something. Man, talk about awkward. Because, you know, you still think they're that yeah. pea brain that sat next to you that you tried to cheat off of, but they weren't smarter. They weren't even as smart as you were. Yeah. You know, and they had all their issues and everything else. That's not them anymore. Right. So, I, I, have, I mean, that's the deal with I know people get on Facebook and they go looking up people that they knew 30, 40 years. I'm not interested. Most of them didn't like me then. I didn't care about them that much, and so I'm not interested in trying to, you know, rebuild something. I'm, I'm just saying all this to say that God wants to be a friend like you've never known. Pick the person that you're closest to, the best friend you've got, and God wants to be more than that. God wants to be a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Now, you're going to have a hard time finding a friend That'll be closer than a brother. Now, brother, you can blacken each other's eyes. You can steal each other's change off the dresser. You can do just about anything. But when push comes to shove, you're going to be there for them, and they're going to be there for you. Because there's something more than just a superficial thing there. There's, there's a bond. There's a sense of responsibility and so on and so forth. I, I, you know, that's true in any real relationship. And God wants to be closer than any brother. Now, I'm pretty close to my brothers, but we don't always get along and don't always see eye to eye. I mean, we have our differences, and we're usually not afraid to express them. <laughs> you know, try not to be hateful, but, you know, it's just the way it is. And yet, each one of us knows if there's a need, the other one's going to be there. We don't talk about it. We don't sit around and tell each other, you know, well, I'm going to be there for you, whatever. We just know that when it happens, they will. That's friendship. That is, that is what God wants you to have, to know that you can depend on him, to know that in spite of all of your flaws and all of the things that the enemy will try to come and shame you with and tell you ought to be ashamed of yourself or that's just it's horrible, that thought you had or that behavior or whatever it is. God wants you to know there is no room for shame in the relationship that he has with you. He sees you as perfect and righteous. Amen? He wants to be your best friend. Look at Isaiah chapter 61 and verse 10. We're going to have to, I'm going to have to hurry up here. Praise the Lord. Isaiah 61 and, and verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. Look at uh, chapter 62, verses 2 through 4. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Thou shalt be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Amen. The robe of righteousness. Amen. A new name. That's powerful. Amen. Especially as an antidote to shame. Praise the Lord. Nakedness and shame are synonymous terms in the Bible. If you look at Revelation chapter 3 and verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, what Don was talking about, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Amen? 
look at Genesis chapter 2 and verse 25. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Because God had clothed them with his glory. It wasn't until they ate from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil that they became ashamed of their nakedness. And that's why the revelation that God has clothed us in a robe of righteousness is so powerful. In and of ourselves, when we operate from religious thinking, it's the knowledge of good and evil. We're constantly reminded of our shortcomings, of us not being good enough. Of not, not, it's like being naked. It's a shame. You're ashamed, right? But that's what God says. I have clothed you, not with just any old rags. I have given you a robe of righteousness, a garment that is white, untainted, unspotted. Praise the Lord. So now, <clears throat> according to 2 Corinthians 5.21, we are the righteousness of God in Christ. Why? Because he clothed us. He's covered our shame. Yes. To be ashamed is to not believe God. God is a friend who says, I see no shame. I see nothing of you for you to be ashamed of. You're my friend. You're my best friend. What about a new name? Amen? That's simply a revelation of our new identity. I don't know what that name will be on the white stone, but I got a feeling somewhere in there is going to be Jesus. He's given us, we already have the new name. We may not know it, but we already have a new identity. As far as God's concerned, he calls us son. We, we have a name that only God knows. And that's who he identifies us with. Not Nathan, not, you know, our, our family traditions, not our, you know, humanity. But he has a name for us where the world may have given me the name Mephibosheth. God has given me a name that says son, best friend, righteous holy and pure. And it's true for you. You say, oh, but I, I haven't really done anything for God. I haven't. It has nothing to do with it. You can't do anything for God anyhow. He did it. You know, a real friend doesn't ask you. It isn't like, uh, I'll use something for example. I don't like loaning stuff. <laughs> you say, well, you tight what? I don't like borrowing stuff because other people don't think about my stuff the way I think about my stuff. My own wife knows. She gets in my vehicle. doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't have to be that one that's out there now. Any one I've ever had. And the last thing I say to her is, bring it back like you took it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now, I'm more concerned about her than I am the vehicle. Don't get me wrong. But I am concerned about the vehicle. I keep them clean. I don't like junk everywhere. And I don't like, you know, when the kids come with me, my daughter will say, here, here's your juice bottle. I'll say, she don't need it. <laughs> she don't need it. I got a cup, but she don't need it. I'll stop and get her all the juice she wants anywhere except in my truck. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah, I know what you think. Ah, oh, you're just a cruel old jerk. No, I'm just a neat freak. I don't eat in it. I don't want anybody else eating in it. I don't want their coffee stains and, you know, jungle juice stains or whatever else it is that they're drinking. I'll take you to Chick-fil-A. You know, I mean, I'll take you to McDonald's. I'll take you someplace and you can get all the drinks you want, but not in here because I know what they do. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. God knows us intimately. 
we don't keep anything from God. We can be as transparent and open and honest, and he loves us. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. We have been given a new name. Chosen friend. How's that work for you? Amen. He chose you to be his friend. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. You ever, you ever play uh, shoes up sides for basketball, football, things like that when you were a kid? There was always a couple of kids that were not very athletic. Maybe they were a little too small or whatever. And they were always the last ones chosen. Right? Amen. But God chooses us. Not based on our abilities, not based on our looks or our size or our agility or anything else. He just chooses us because he wants us. Right? There's nothing you can do to impress God, to get him to choose you. I remember kids in school, this never happened to me because I was usually trying to avoid it, but kids that knew the answers... You know, and I'm thinking, God, I just want to smack that kid. I don't know. I don't want to know. And I don't want to know what you know. Yeah. But you know him. Yeah. Call on me. Call on me. I got... God doesn't call on us because we've got the answers. He calls on us because he loves us. Yeah. He don't care what your answer is. Yeah. He's got the answers. Yeah. He's got the answer sheet. He doesn't need yours. Right. Praise the Lord. Jesus chose you not because of who you are, what you are, what you could be. He chose you because he wanted you. So you could be with him. Get the, imagine. So that you could be with him, the God of the universe. That's incredible. He wants to hang out with you. You are his best friend. You are his chosen friend. Praise the Lord. Proverbs 18, verse 24. Praise God. Hallelujah. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. That's the truth. If you don't want friends, you, won't, you ain't going to have friends. I can tell you that right now. You've got to show yourself friendly. Well, God has shown himself friendly. Praise the Lord. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 11. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he's not ashamed to call them brethren. If he's not ashamed to call me his brother, then I'd be really stupid to be ashamed to be his brother. Amen? Because he that sanctifies and me that sanctified are the same as far as God's concerned. And because of that, because we're the same, he's not ashamed to call me his brother Amen. and his friend. And he feels exactly that way about you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So the second thing he wants to be is a father. To experience God on a deeper level is the, re is the reason for this. So we experience him as a living reality and not just some theological yeah. prospect. Right. Not just some positional truth, but a tangible, real, physical reality. Amen. It's really what the Christian life is, is, is about. It's not about rules. It's not about rituals. It's not about routines. It's about relationship. Period. 
Religion is about performance. Amen? This is not... See, Christianity is about a relationship with a person. Not just, ju not just a knowledge about him, like I said with the, with the little test, at the job interview, but knowing God. The more, the more we know God, the more likely we are to operate in the truth of God. Most of us are working from, you know, kind of a, a, a backup position. We, most of our lives, even as Christians, it was kind of screwed up. It was, it was a lot of false information. It was never really about the relationship. We were ashamed to approach God for the relationship, even though we knew that we were supposedly saved. But God is saying, look, as the way I see you is just like me. That's why I can call you brother. As I am, so are you in this present world. But you can't have that without a relationship. You can't have that just simply by theological debate or, or just learning scriptures. It's, it's something that is personal. You have to believe it. Look at, let's look at this in John chapter 7, verse 37 and 38. Now, this is amazing to me. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Amen? Now, that, the message was it something new? This was not a new message when Jesus spoke it. But it confounded the religious leaders of that day, just like it would if the people that you were talking to understood the scripture, if they really understood what it was he's saying. It, they'd be confused by it too. Right. Amen? Surely those leaders, those, those religious people, knew the scriptures. Just like the people you talk to, I talk to, we all talk to, they know, they can tell you a scripture. They just don't understand the scripture. They're making it mean what they want it to mean based on their religion. That scripture is something that had been around for millennium prior to Jesus speaking it. It was a long standing invitation to us, to people. Look in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 1 and 2. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye and buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread? and your labor for that which satisfieth not. Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Somehow, by the time that, that, that Jesus comes along, the message had gotten lost. Mm -hmm. Now they were practicing a religion that was all about duty, mm -hmm. obligations, responsibilities, they had abandoned their desire. They had abandoned the relationship. And they replaced it with knowledge and performance. People may be able to beat you up with their theological knowledge, but they'll never be able to take that relationship away from you. How many of you ever been... You had people come in there just quoting stuff left and right, and, and you're going, whoa, your head's just spinning. You know the truth. You just can't maybe put your finger on it at that moment. You don't have the scripture in your head. And they can't shake you. Even though their argument may sound logical, it doesn't work. It doesn't sway you at all. Because you know something down inside of you has determined, I know this God, and that's not him. That's right. Come on. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 through 29.
Anybody bring their pet? <laughs> Praise the Lord. But before faith came, we were kept under the law. Before faith. Shut up under the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, so that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. Be good to share that with these people. Amen. For ye are the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by the law. But at, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So under the law, you can't win. If you see yourself as a failure, you're going to fail. But even under the law, you're going to be driven then by guilt and shame to try to be better. Yeah. Right? Or, by the law, if you have any modicum of success, you'll be overcome by pride. You can't win. Because even, like, like Paul said, you know, there's a certain amount of, he was showing us the pride that comes with being born a Hebrew, you know, a, a Jew of Jews, a, 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 you know, a Benjamite, uh, you know, circumcised the eighth day, all the things, everything I did, I fasted, I prayed, I did all the stuff, amen, everything, that caused the Jews, the Pharisees especially, to be filled with pride. Now, it was ironic because they're pointing their finger at the people who were not being able to do it as failures, which was true under the law, but they were as big a failure for their success because pride took over where shame and humility and, and uh, you know, uh, guilt was the reverse of it. Praise the Lord. We, we started out as just God's creation. But as it was said here earlier, now we're born again. We are living children of the living God. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. DNA. Yeah. God's DNA. Yeah. If it were Spider-Man, it would be arachnids or whatever. Whatever they call them. Arachnophobia or something. Praise the Lord. Remember the story of Pinocchio? See, you know, Roberto watches these dramas that are <laughs> relatively deep, apparently, and, and moving, and, of course, I'm watching Pinocchio. <laughs> Remember the story? Despite all of his rebellion, I love Jiminy the Cricket, you know, Jiminy Cricket. This is like... It's kind of like, uh, oh, uh, I'll never, I'll, I'll, I better not go there. Praise the Lord. It's uh, Pinocchio, even though he was rebellious, right? <clears throat> he was lying. Mm -hmm. He was uh, self willed. Mm -hmm. He was finally transformed. He was hanging out with those naughty kids, you know, and doing bad stuff, treating his creator, you know, like, so what? But he was transformed. He wasn't just a creation of his master puppet builder, Geppetto. He became a new creation, a living, breathing, fully alive son to the one who had created him. So there's a little Pinocchio in all of us, praise the Lord. <laughs> right? But God has made us living children of his. Where before we were his creation, yes, but without relationship. Right? right? A, 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 away from God, distant from God, not paying attention, didn't care about God. Yeah. But he transforms us anyhow. Because yeah. he wants children, not just creations. Praise the Lord. Amen. 
Okay, I'll skip to this quickly. The third thing God wants to be is a bridegroom. He says, I'll take delight in you as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride. So will I rejoice over you. So we might say then in return, I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. Now, as a man, I got to admit, I have a lot of problems. <laughs> Praise the Lord with Song of Songs. It's beautiful, it's poetic, it's prose, it's all of that stuff, but it's just really awkward as a man. My mind has to do some serious adjusting to get or to grasp the concept of being Christ's bride. Now, I know that has nothing to do with, with sex and, you know, our relationship with Jesus. It has nothing to do with that. But it's hard as a guy to think of a bride and, you know, well, maybe, okay, we'll move on. Hallelujah. But, you know, what I'm saying, I think, you know, if you're honest, all of us are just going, awkward. You know, I mean, how does this work out? So. Yeah. But the truth is, it has nothing to do with sex, but it has everything to do with romance. Mm -hmm. It is romantic. Mm -hmm. There's something about this love of God that can't be limited to just friendship. Mm -hmm. You know, guys, we get awkward. You know, it's, when, even when you care about somebody, you know, and it's always kind of you give them a hug and then it's just a little <laughs> chest bump, you know, a little check. If they hold you a little too tight or a little too long, it's... <clears throat> <clears throat> See the Hawkeyes yesterday? <laughs> there are some boys there. I'd like to have been out there playing with them. Yeah, we just get uncomfortable. But the consummation of this relationship is in heaven. Yeah. It's a spiritual reality. Mm -hmm. Amen. I, I'm not going to use any more scriptures just for the sake of time, so I'll just get right through this. But the fruit of the Spirit. Now, if we're thinking, and I, I know I don't want to go there, but I'm saying there are metaphors here. So the fruit of a, say it this way, for the fruit of a honeymoon is probably going to be a child. Right. Or the fruit of what goes on on honeymoons at some point would be a child. Mm -hmm. But the fruit of the Spirit is what God's trying to get us to understand about the intimacy of this relationship. Right. Not the sex stuff and all of that. Mm -hmm. But there is fruit yeah. right. that is born out of this relationship. Yeah. And the fruit of that Spirit is love. Not rejection, right. love. Yeah. It's joy, not a heavy burden. Amen. It's peace, not a critical spirit. Right. When people come and start that stuff, you know right away yeah. they are not in relationship with God. They may be believers. They, I'm not questioning whether they are believers or not, but you know that they don't have a relationship or there would be some fruit showing. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Hallelujah. It's kindness. It's goodness, it's faithfulness, it's gentleness, it's self-control, not denial and repression. Right. Praise the Lord. You are Christ's friend. Mm -hmm. A servant is accepted and appreciated on the basis of what he does. You are no longer servants, he says, but children, mm -hmm. sons. Heirs, joint heirs, right? The servant is based on, the relationship with the servant is based on how they do what it is that they do. But the child is based on who they are, period. Servant starts the day anxious, worried, afraid that their work isn't going to please their boss. And I could be out the door today. They could fire me. They won't want me to be there anymore, right? But a child, I worked for my dad. I w wanted to be fired. <laughs> I begged to be fired. I couldn't get out of the job. <laughs> Praise 
Praise the Lord. I had to run away practically to get out of it. You know, I mean, that's just the way it was. Dads are different than just regular employees. Amen? A child rests in the security of that parent's love. A servant is accepted because of their workmanship. A son or a daughter, because of the relationship. Praise the Lord. A servant is accepted because of productivity and performance. A child belongs because of their position. You are God's child. Look, let's look at this last scripture. Galatians chapter 4 verse 7. You are God's child. He is your father. That's not a metaphor now. That's the reality. That's the truth. Praise the Lord. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Praise the Lord. Remember, you've been joined to Christ. Praise the Lord. In Revelation 21, you don't have to go there, Sheila, but it talks about these precious jewels. It talks about the city of God coming down out of heaven, which is us. It's not a town. It's not a bunch of buildings. It's people. But he talks about it in a way that he describes it as jasper and precious jewels coming down out of heaven. Well, it's amazing because in, in Isaiah 54, where it talks about, O oh, thou forsaken, sing thou barren, you that have been forsaken, you know, the wife of the... Uh, destitute with no children and so on and so forth. You're going to break forth on the left hand, the right hand. And many children will be the result of this relationship. Great will be the fruit of it. And then it begins to describe you. And he says, Jasper walls, the same stones that it talks about there. He's talking about how God sees you. You're precious in the mind of God. Amen. You are his precious bride. In the Song of Solomon, I'll never forget. You can go there if you want. I'll close with this. Uh, chapter 2, verses 10 through 13. I'll never forget uh, Suzanne brought a, when, when we first moved into this building, brought a tape series of, I think it was Mike Bickle, if I'm not mistaken, of Song of Solomon. I, oh, man, I mean, I really struggled with that. <laughs> In fact, I don't think I ever really got through it. I, it was so uncomfortable. I thought, this, this is for a women's Bible study. <laughs> it doesn't work for me. It's just not right. But I, I've learned a little bit since then. And here he says, my beloved spake and said unto me, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flower appears on the earth, the time of spring of birds has come. The voice of the turtle is heard in our land. The fig tree putteth forth her green figs, and the vines with the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Praise the Lord. We are this precious bride. He's coming for us, and he's going to take us away. There won't be any sexual identity confusion. Amen. We'll love him as he loves us. And we'll be caught up in the air to be with him. And there shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. So who are you? And, and what's the truth? Well, the truth is you are in Christ. And you are Christ. The body of Christ. Amen. You have impeccable credentials. There is no shame. Those credentials cannot be challenged. Though the enemy tries to, they're unchallengeable. Praise the Lord. That's who you are, and that's the truth. Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Thank you so much. Thank all of you for your testimonies. Appreciate your patience. Amen. God bless you. Go out there and just be bold. 
as bold can be. You have nothing to be ashamed of. You are the righteousness of God in Christ and should expect every blessing because he wants to pour it out on you. Amen? God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.